I, this was called uh, AOL's blockchain moment earlier, but it's actually the other way around. It's actually blockchain's AOL moment. Who here remembers uh, AOL? Anyone? Um, who here still uses AOL? Bullshit. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about why. So usually I get called the contrarian or the, um, or the angry guy in the room um, because I always like to, <laughs> to look the opposite way and say why people are so stupid. And today's talk is going to be about why blockchains are such a ridiculous idea in general. Um, although I'm bullish a lot of the industry. Um, and I'm going to talk about why we're getting towards the AOL moment. And that'll make sense a little bit later on in the presentation. So we're going to go through a little bit of a history lesson where I kind of take you guys through what money is, because a lot of people don't understand what money is. Then we're going to talk about why most blockchains are bullshit, why most tokens and ICOs are really bad investments. We're gonna, I'm going to give you guys these things called the, what I call the three key fallacies, and then give you an idea of where the, uh, where the value is going to actually accrue and be captured in this space. So a bit of my background. So as Cameron butchered earlier, <laughs> I, um, I'm involved in fintech and all this sort of stuff. But basically, um, I've been around tech for a while, so I've got a little bit of an idea what's going on. I did buy Bitcoin early. I lost all the stuff because I didn't take it seriously back in the day. Um, and I left the space for other more interesting stuff, and then I came back into it in 2016 in a big way. So the purpose of this talk is to try and take everyone back to fundamentals, back to the basics, back to first principles and foundations, because I, I feel like as humans, we get excited about things, and we see something new and shiny, and we run ahead, and we overestimate what is actually good about it, and we blow things out of proportion. It happens with every single technological trend. In fact, it happens with everything. Um, and I'm going to try and bring people back to what's important, and hopefully by the end of this talk, you won't think that I'm just a negative asshole. Um, you'll hopefully think that there's a little bit of substance there. Has anyone read this book? Oh, crap, only two people. All right, it, okay, three. Read it, please, for the love of God. It's one of the most important books um, that's ever been written. And this will actually teach you more about why Bitcoin and crypto is important than any other Bitcoin book ever written. Um, I'm going to give you guys a quick, uh, the, the short version of that book. So it's 600 pages. I'm going to try to do it in five minutes. It's a story of how humans, or in our form that we're all sitting here as homo sapiens, have evolved and gone from some little hairy ape. Is my clicker working? It's not from some little hairy ape to the top of the food chain. And what it takes us through is this, has anyone ever heard of a concept called Dunbar's number? So Dunbar's number is this cognitive limit where it's, it's a biological constraint. We are, as human beings in, in our uh, component of the species, able to have deep, complex relationships with about 150 people. And that's been proven throughout time. Every species has its own type of Dunbar's number. So ants have it up in the millions. They can. Uh, do complex uh, interactions with uh, millions of other ants, and it's a biological limit. Now, we are the only species on the face of the planet that has been able to transcend this Dunbar's number. And this is where things get interesting. We're able to transcend it, and this is the really fast version, through a mixture of complex language and what's more important, this thing called shared fictions. Shared fictions allow us, and I'll explain what they are in the moment, but shared fictions allow us to do complex coordination and cooperation beyond that 150 person limit, beyond Dunbar's number. We can create complex social constructs and we can create trust outside of what our biological limits are. So the best way to think about shared fictions, and a lot of people get them mixed up, they think they're lies. Now, monkeys, for example, can lie. Monkeys can go and say, look, there's, a, there's an eagle in the sky and the other monkey runs off and he steals his banana. Um, you know, monkeys can also say, you know, can tell the truth about something that is not functionally happening in front of them. Is they can say, there's a lion at the river, don't go down there, and they're warning of danger. Only our species, you know, us weird creatures sitting here, um, you know, in this room, only we can say something as stupid as the lion is the spirit ancestor of our people. What the hell does that mean? Nothing. And through that type of shared fiction, through that type of shared belief, us as humans or as homo sapiens, we're able to create a bunch of uh, complexity in society. We're able to abstract it up further. And the kind of things we create are these. Castes, races, gods, kings, laws, nations, corporations, religion. And we make things up to allow us to make uh, society more complex and for us to do more things. The the social contract or the social construct or the shared fiction that's lasted the longest throughout history is money. 
and that's Banan. It's it's the earliest it's the earliest uh, form of shared fiction. It's the earliest form of communication or recorded communication that we have. It's the ultimate convergent network and all these other things. It inherently has no value. I'm putting these points on here because they're going to plant some seeds for later. But money is the fundamental shared fiction that allows uh, human beings to build society because it represents something objectively that we can all agree on, and that's value. And value makes society function. So most people don't actually understand what money is. There's always these disagreements between money is this, money is that, money should have inherent value, hard money, soft money, easy money, and all this sort of stuff. But this right here is a definition of what, what from, from the studies and the research I've done, studying money, studying economics, studying all of this stuff, is what represents good money is something that has these attributes, and that something could be anything. Um, that has for, uh, fungibility, portability, durability, blah, 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 blah. And a good definition of money is something that stores value that we can agree on that has that type of social construct, sorry, social contract and agreement. It's an abstraction or representation of value or a measure of um, wealth, which is another word for a unit of account. Now, we see this in action throughout history as we've evolved. So we started off with uh, barter, which was, it still happens in really small um, uh, communities. And we evolved out of barter because barter breaks down with complexity, and we moved on to something called commodities money, which was we're like, all right, let's um, trade cattle, let's trade salt, sugar, and all these things, because we can agree that they have some form of value. And then we realized, wait a minute, they're not very durable, they don't have many of these traits, as I've mentioned here, so maybe we need some sort of abstraction to represent money, things that we can all agree represent value, but are not inherently valuable. We moved further to better abstractions through metals, bronze, and all that sort of stuff, and then we moved into things like gold. Now, this next part is where things get interesting, where we moved from ancient money into modern money. And this is where the concept of trust really started to come into play, where the ancient Romans and the ancients, they all realized that you know, people don't walk around with scales back then when you know, wanted to trade some gold. You know, gold was a great type of money, but no one actually knew what you were trading for. You know, you, number one, you, you were too illiterate. You didn't know how to count anyway. And number two, you didn't carry a scale around with you. So they said, all right, let's stamp this um, piece of silver or metal or whatever with an emperor's thing, and that's how much it's worth, and we can agree that how, that's how much it's worth. And what was able to happen with those societies is that adopted a an agreed form of this value exchange of money, they were able to build empires, etc. Now, that sort of lasted, that kind of model lasted for a couple thousand years until we got to this concept of gold-backed paper money. Now, the, the timeline is far more complex than that, um, but this is just a quick overview to sort of show you how things have evolved. So we went to gold-backed paper money in the, um, in the 1500s, and we went on and off the gold standard uh, throughout the centuries. And then in the... Um, in the it was later than the 50s after Kosh's talk yesterday, but I didn't bother changing the slide. We moved on to this thing called fiat paper money, which is not backed by anything except for a promise, um, which again is a social construct. Now, arguably, that actually makes better money than gold-backed money. Um, so does plastic money. It makes for more efficient money. If we go back to here and we look at all of those attributes, the more attributes that you have there, the better the type of money you have. And here we are now at digital money. And now when I talk about digital money, I don't mean Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. I mean the stuff that you see on your net bank, on your banking and all of that. That's been the most efficient form of money we've ever had throughout society. And it's allowed us to do a hell of a lot more than we've ever been able to do as a society and as our species. But what happened throughout this process was trust siloed further and further and further till it got into where we are now, the hands of the few. Now, What's really important about this, because money at its most fundamental level is just a trusted social contract. That's all it is. When you silo money to the point where it's um, you know, potentially controlled or perceived to be controlled by the few, you actually undermine that trust. And that's what's happened with the current uh, system in money now. People you know, think US dollar and all that sort of stuff is going to collapse, which I don't necessarily agree with. But um, we, we have come to the point where people don't trust the amount of money. And the problem is, and I'll touch on Kosha's talk yesterday that he was here discussing around fractional reserve lending. I don't think fractional reserve lending or fractionalizing money or assets is a bad idea unless it's invisible. And when you can't see what's being fractionalized, you can't make a judgment call and you can't actually do something with it. And the problem that we have now is lack of visibility with this digital money that's been fractionalized and abstracted, where it's usable on one side but untrusted on the other. So in 2009, 
we've got this new, very effective form of money, which is the first form to achieve maximum abstraction, so all of those attributes that we looked at before, but it's also managed to create, um, it's also managed to add trust to that Lego block without the centralized type of institutions that we have that give us the abstracted digital money that we have now. And this is the really important thing. Along with a chain of events over the last 10 years that were a complete fluke, nobody expected this shit, and I don't care what anyone says that bought it early, no one expected this. Plus the network effect, the momentum, the grassroots, all of that sort of stuff. Bitcoin represented something like the internet, not like AOL, that has gained a lot of traction, built an entire ecosystem around it. So this is where I get onto bashing blockchain, so bear with me. This right here, this formula represents this new type of money. This formula here represents what Bitcoin is, which is a mix of networks, proof of work, decentralization, economic theory, incentives, disincentives, computer science, all of this sort of stuff, along with a data structure, which is blocks of data cryptographically linked in a chain. That formula, that set of things, gives you something that is technically and socially secure through the game theory and through the economic incentives and disincentives. It's also slow, it's also decentralized, it's also expensive, it's also censorship resistant, all of that sort of stuff. Unstoppable to a cost, um, you know, related to a cost benefit ratio of stopping it. And this is sort of what I like to call what it is. It's a technological solution to a societal problem with far reaching political implications if you want to take a photo of that. Um, now, that model, that formula, that set of stuff all in one place only has a few use cases. It is a great use case for a digital reserve type asset that nobody can manipulate. It is a great use case for something like scarce digital collectibles, um, for a potential medium of exchange down the track, for identity governance, for, for a few things. And where people go wrong is they either assume that blockchain, the word blockchain means all of that formula, or what most people actually do is they say, eh, that other stuff doesn't really matter. Let's just focus on this little corner here. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are stupid, but hey, blockchain is great because we can create some form of efficiency, which is also a lot of shit. Um, but that's where they focus. And they come out and they say, all right, you know, the, the narrative really started in 2015 with the, with the group called the R3 group, where they said, we're going to build a better blockchain. Um, that word was never even mentioned in the white paper. I don't know how many people have actually read the white paper. The, the word doesn't exist in there. There was, there was a conversation around data being grouped in blocks and then cryptographically hashed together and linked together in the chain of these blocks. And it was just made up in 2015 to discredit what this real innovation was, which was a new form of money, a new form of social contract that was more robust than the current system. So if you take all of the other stuff out and you just focus on this, you basically have a sequential database. It's fucking useless. Um, so that's what that point means. And then if you assume that blockchain's all of this, it's complete overkill for 99% of applications out there. You wouldn't use it for half the stuff that people are running around saying, hey, you need a blockchain for this. Bullshit. So this is sort of my really fancy, um, uh, it's gone out. But th this is literally, when you look at blockchains, you look at these two things. You say, all right, do I need a full blockchain, which is all of those ingredients? Then you've got what's called a Rube Goldberg machine. You've got this big thing that's useless for most other things. Or if you've got a partial blockchain, which is just that piece in the corner, it's completely useless. So if you don't know what a Rube Goldberg machine, that's what it is. It's a self-operating napkin is an example of it, where it's just complete overkill for stuff. So again, coming back to this, I feel like I'm bashing on it, but Bitcoin's a recipe of all of these things put together. And it's what I like to call a zero to one innovation. Before Bitcoin, there was nothing like it. There was nothing that had all of that recipe all in one. Everything that's come after it has been a, a variation on it, a variation on that recipe or a piece of ingredient out of that recipe trying to be marketed and framed in the same way, um, which is effectively what I say here. So the money question, where are blockchains actually useful? How about marketing? There's a thing called the Nirvana theorem, which is we're going to sprinkle a little blockchain on everything and we'll make it all better, right? Um, anyone heard of Long Island Ice Tea Corp? Anyone heard of these guys? Yep. Do you know they're now called Long Island Blockchain? Does anyone actually know that? Yep. Okay. Yeah. They literally changed their name to Long Island Blockchain and that's what happened to their stock price. It went up 400, 500% or something like that. So that's a really good use case for blockchain. If you want to make some money, go out there, whatever your business is. If you do landscaping, for example, just say you now do blockchain landscaping, I guarantee you'll get more business. So that's one use case for blockchain. 
the other use case, and that should actually say tokens there. I don't know why it's disappeared. But yeah, this is where things get ugly. <laughs> the tokens have been deleted. Oh, sorry, there they are. Um, in the good old days, startups would go and raise capital via the sale of a thing called equity. In the good old days. Now, the companies, by doing that, would share what's called value capture. So if the company made money, they, if they captured value in the marketplace, they would share that with the investors. And the investors would go and share the risk with the company by sharing in the equity, by putting capital forward. Now, in today's Wild Wild West, these startups, who are run by morons uh, usually, um, raise capital via the sale of a token. The company shares no value capture with the, um, with the investors and the investor carries all the risk of the investment. And what's more important, and I'll get into this right now, is tokens behave like money. They do not behave like equity in the company. They don't participate in the value capture that the business does. So here's, um, man, use a Mac next time. <laughs> let's, let's, ah, uh, it is? Is it PowerPoint or is it Keynote? Okay, anyway, doesn't matter. So money and tokens behave very different to um, equity. And this is where people conflate the two concepts together. And this is a really short uh, economics lesson I'm going to give you now. Money and tokens are not a productive asset, and they're not inherently valuable. That is what money should behave like. Bitcoin is not inherently valuable. It's a social contract, just like any other money. It's a social contract that we agree is valuable or represents value because it's got a set of attributes. Tokens behave and money behaves on things like velocity, supply, demand, inflation, deflation, MV equals PQ on a completely different uh, ground and a completely different battlefield and a completely different set of mathematical you know, uh, calculations. Whereas equity is inherent value. When you own a piece of equity in a company, there is value being captured by that entity which you share in. It is ownership in a productive asset. That's what it represents. That's what equity is. That's why when people run around and they bash Warren Buffett like, oh yeah, he missed Bitcoin. Well, Warren Buffett's worth $100 billion. I'm pretty sure he's doing well. And he looks for buying assets or buying equity in companies that are creating and capturing value. That's why he doesn't like things like gold and um, Bitcoin inherently. Now, I disagree with him on some things, but each, each to their own. What I think the problem is is that people come into this stuff and they say, oh, well, you, you know, Warren Buffett made money investing and you know, he bought value stuff. So now that the tokens are low in price, we'll buy the tokens. No, you idiot. Stay away because tokens don't function like equity. Just because someone has a good idea um, and issues a token, you can. So I'll give you the, the best example is like this: If you have a really good use case for a business, and you issue a token which has uh, haven't you, where you haven't thought out supply, demand, inflation, deflation, all that sort of stuff, you can have a really good business that does really good stuff, and you can have a token worth zero. Or if you have a really, really bad business that doesn't capture any value in the marketplace and doesn't do shit for the world, and you create a token where you burn an amount at a certain time and you, you know, fuck around with the supply and um, demand situation and the inflation and the MV equals PQ and all that sort of stuff, you can have a token that's worth a crap load and a business that's a piece of crap. They're, they're completely non-related. And I get a little bit passionate about this stuff because I just see so many people running around buying crap where they don't understand what the hell they're buying. So... Money and tokens don't behave like equity. So, again, I bash it a little bit further. So what you're essentially buying when you're buying these ICOs and tokens and businesses that are representing, you know, or that we're going to issue a token is you're buying vaporware. And it's easy to sell because there's no limit to what vaporware can do, if you've noticed. You know, these days you've got AI blockchains that wash your clothes and drive your car and, you know, are going to usher in the next, you know, wave of human prosperity and solve poverty and all this crap. So where we are at the moment is I don't believe we've even hit the peak of inflated expectation yet. I think we're going to hit there. Has anyone seen this graph, the Gartner hype cycle? Yeah. So we are yet to go anywhere near a trough of disillusionment. Um, when the trough of disillusionment comes, it's going to be the point where rooms like this are completely empty and everyone's like, you know what, that, wasn't that blockchain thing last year? You know, or wasn't that crypto thing last year? We haven't hit that yet. And that is because the whole bubble hasn't burst yet. There's still people running around trying to come up with ideas and stupidities and frame them in constructs that don't count um, neither fundamentally nor economically nor, you know, socially speaking. So, now that I've bashed on everything, where will the value capture in this space happen? This is where the AOL piece comes in. AOL, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, whenever they were around, they said something specific. They said, the internet is stupid. Um, we have a better way of doing the internet. 
we will put chat in there, we'll do all this sort of stuff, and we will build a better internet. Netscape, Google, and Hotmail came out, and they said, no, 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 we'll make the internet useful. Who's still around? Does anyone use Google here by any chance? You know, I mean, I'm, Hotmail kind of sucks now because Google kicked their ass, but um, you know, Netscape, Hotmail, Google, th those guys ushered in and they made this technology useful. What we need to do today is we need to make this existing technology useful. You know, you got money, for fuck's sake. For the first time in history, we've created a new type of money that we can do something with. Um, and there's some other features that come off that concept that we can do stuff with, but it's the enabler. So these are the sort of companies that I see, and I've kind of cheekily jabbed myself in there. But where will the value accrue? The value is going to accrue in the enablers, in the on-ramps, in the utilities, in the access points, in the wallets, the storage, the collectibles, the digital assets. They're, they're the thing, that's where the value is going to accrue, not in some other ridiculous blockchain idea that's going to be better than Bitcoin or some other ridiculous thing that's going to be better than Ethereum or any of that sort of stuff. It's not where the value is going to accrue. Now, the reason I have this slide in here wasn't so much for this audience. This was, I actually presented this to a room full of investors where all the other companies that were presenting were ICOs. So they wanted to kill me afterwards. <laughs> But anyway, um, I, one of the guys actually came up to me afterwards. He's like, I really hate you, but he goes, you're right. <laughs> so um, I convinced him not to do a token, to do an actual business, because he had a good idea, except he took a crap on it by trying to do a token. So anyway, key takeaways. Money is not equity. They don't function the same. Tokens function like money. Think about it differently. So treating cryptocurrencies and tokens like their equity when, in fact, their money is a recipe for disaster, a recipe for having your portfolio down 90% now, like I'm sure most people's are. Um, Fundamental fallacy number two, this is the Nirvana fallacy, and I hate this one. Blockchains or .com or the Uber 4 is going to fix everything. No, it won't. It doesn't work in every single context. There's only very few contexts for all these sorts of things to function in. And then you've got this one, which a lot of people, a lot of people have heard of the first two, but this one most people don't understand is the precision fallacy. You've got people running around coming up with, you know, mathematical equations and stuff that they've learnt from years of mental models in capital markets and equity markets and all that sort of stuff, and they try and apply it into a space they have no understanding of, because none of us, I don't give a shit who gets up here and talks about this stuff, none of us get it. None of us. Not me, not you, no one gets it. We're just running around trying to figure it out as we go. And you've got people running around saying, look, we've got these mathematical primitives and, and models that will apply to this, and it gives you this illusion of certainty, and then when it all goes wrong, you run for the exits, and then you end up having... Uh, old mate over here, turn up again, Gartner. And you have those sorts of cycles. And, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> My favorite two slides, <laughs> which I could have done this whole presentation with these two slides, is, do I need a token? No. And then, if you're a business and you're thinking about the next question, do I need a blockchain? No, you don't. You just need to run a business. That's it. Make some money, for the love of Christ. That's all you need to do. Um, so. I'm going to finish it with this. Most blockchains are bullshit. Businesses and tokens do not mix well. They don't function in the same sort of space, and trying to mix and conflate the two together is a bad idea. Um, you should run from a company that says we're doing an ICO or a blockchain. Just, just run in the opposite direction. Um, value will be captured by the businesses that enable the use of these digital assets and currencies and the like. That's where I think the value, and again, I could be wrong. And these are my two predictions. I think blockchain, the, the, the whole term, is going to go down in history with this information superhighway and the AOLs of the world, you know, because the information superhighway is what's going to be better than the internet, remember? Um, and I think ICOs will go down in history as the dot-com stupidities of the late 90s. So that's me. I do a lot of writing on Medium. I, I, I write on Hacker Noon as well, um, not to blow smoke up my ass, but I've, I, I think I'm in, like, the top 10 Bitcoin writers in the world or whatever. So I do a lot of stuff there. If you want to read some stuff, I've got a longer version of that um, talk about Homo sapiens and why this whole thing's important, how we've gotten from you know, being apes to this point now. Um, and I think I'll tie it up there for some questions, if anyone has any. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that, Alex. Um, we've got a few minutes for, for some questions. So who would, who would like to ask a question? Thanks for the speech, Alex. No worries, man. Um, you, we're talking about people not really knowing how to predict what's going to happen. So with that in mind, what's your view on technical analysis for trading? T technical analysis has nothing to do with fundamentals. That's the thing. So I've been, I've been trading since 2007. And um, I went through the whole GFC. I went through the whole gold, sure. silver, boom, bust, and all that sort of stuff. I've been through all of it. And technicals are just a representation of human psychology, of, or, or what I like to call human stupidity. It's literally... Fear, greed, fear, greed, fear, greed. That's all it is. It's got nothing to do with the fundamental of anything. 
So when people do technical analysis, all they're doing is they're, you know, looking at, you know, humans and, you know, the sheep mentality and the herd mentality running up and down, um, you know, for the door and back in the door and out the door and in the door. That's all it is. So we're, we're, if, if you're trying to look at something fundamentally through a technical lens, it's just a waste of time. Um, if you're trying to look at something technical through a fundamental lens, it's also a waste of time. So just keep, keep the two separate. And I think when people are trading, that, that's a completely different game. It's got nothing to do with buying something for a fundamental reason. And, and that's why people like Buffett, again, he'll, he, he doesn't look at a chart. The guy couldn't read a chart if you paid him to do it. Like, he doesn't know what that stuff means. So he goes in, he reads financials, he reads numbers, he reads the, the, the underlying, where, where is the value in this entity and what are they capturing? And does that relate back to, the, to a price per um, share and the earnings and all that sort of stuff? And then he goes and buys. That's a very different um, analysis than technical. Technical is made up. Great. Thanks, Alex. We've got la last question up here for you. Okay. Hey, Alex. Hey, man. Appreciate the speech. It was actually um, really good. Thanks, man. Just quick, quick a uh, couple questions. First one, uh, what's your damage? Damage on? Why are you so angry? Oh, um, <laughs> good question. <laughs> um, my, no, my, pet hate in, my pet hate in life is just stupidity. No, like, joke, I get really joke angry. question, mate. It was a joke question. No, 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 but, it, but it's true. It's a good question. I just, I just hate stupidity, and I, it drives me nuts. So then I go on these mad rants. I agree. And, um, yeah. yeah. No, I love your energy. Um, realistic, s serious question is um, or, or a bit of a statement question. So I think I, I tend to agree with you on a lot of the stuff, yep. but I also disagree on a lot of the stuff as well. Um, so I believe that, yes, it is hyped, and then the word is being labelled and used way too much. Um, but I'm also, so saying that, it sounds like I'm against everything on blockchain, but, but I'm sort of on the same side as everyone wanting to tokenize everything as well. So you're sort of mixed up. And I think the, the worst bit is um, what the media is doing and all the bad press and the token stuff and the ICOs and money raising. But I think, like, yesterday we had a pre presentation from um, a need from SAP, and they were using blockchain under the radar. Like, no one, no one really knows. It's but, just but private not, clients. They're not, they're not using a blockchain. That's, it's, again, it's a buzzword. It's got nothing to do with it. Can, well, can you explain to me how blockchain functions? Well, I'm pretty sure, yeah, you showed us examples of them actually using blockchain um, in the shipping industry. Yeah, okay. And um, why can't they just do that through a normal database? Well, I think they can. Um, well, of course you can. You can, you can use it. It's exactly the same. But I Correct. think just it's exactly, the, that's exactly my point. So again, they're just yeah. using it for marketing, nothing else. It's, there's no reason to actually use it. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so sorry to jump over you like that. But no, again, no, 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 that's just, good. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there, is, there is no reason to use it. So the only time you want to use that architecture is when you can start applying economic incentives and game theory and all of that so that you have a network that operates without someone having to operate the network. And that's where that, that's, that's the innovation, not yeah. the piece where you've just changed the way you do the database. That, that, that's not innovation. That's bullshit. That's just marketing. You know, like, do you know what MongoDB is? No. Okay. That was the greatest innovation in database structures for the last, you know, 10 years. None of us here said anything about it because none of us know what the fuck it is, but it had no money or monetary stuff tied to it. Exactly. So now right. that someone's created this new database type structure off the back of reading a white paper and noticing, hey, wait a minute, there's data that's grouped and it's chained and all this sort of stuff, I call it a blockchain. Um, you know, people are just jumping on a bandwagon. It actually means nothing and it's completely useless um, outside of that broader context with all of the other stuff in that recipe. I swear to God, this right here, and I'm not just blowing my own crap, but you know, this right here is, where is it? Eh. That. It's really, really important because it doesn't work without the whole recipe. It's like making a cake and you just forgot the flour. You're going to have mush. My girlfriend did that. She tried to make That's brownies. Yeah, so you see no value. Do you see no value in the decentralization of a, of a database? Uh, that's just replication of data. That's all it is. That, that, that doesn't mean anything. You know, it, it, most people do that. There's, that's called just redundancy. You know, the rep replication of it... Um, and just having it in more places is just security redundancy, that's all. Now, having different people manage um, the database, you need to give them some sort of incentive to come to a consensus that that is the right state of the ledger. And then, again, you just end up flowing into the rest of the recipe again. So, so there's no way out of that if you want to decentralize and allow it to function on its own without somebody managing that function. And that's the, mo that's the, that's the important part there. If you want to get someone to manage the function, and someone's in charge of making sure that the state is accurate across all participants, then you don't have a blockchain. You've just got a shared database, which is now just being called a blockchain because it's more marketable. That kind of stuff has existed for ages. Thanks for your time. Cool.
Awesome, fantastic. Uh, yeah, please.